Hello, welcome to Image Bearers. My name is Atoma Eji. This is the second season, the 28th episode. I'm so excited to be joined by some awesome friends today who are going to be uh, kind of co-interviewing, if you will, our good friend, uh, Mike Burns. So we have uh, here today, Greg Moots from Michigan, if you could just give a wave. We have uh, Chris, uh, Kisa Frugge from California. We have Gordon Ferguson, Ferguson from Texas. And we have Mayan Brandt from Michigan. And I'm also here in Michigan. So uh, we'll be interviewing again, as I said, uh, Mike Burns on this incredible book that he wrote, Escaping the Beast, uh, subtitled Politics, Allegiance, and Kingdom. And uh, I sent a note to Mike a little bit after I read it, and I said, this is a very courageous book because uh, I think Mike really has put together, and I believe uh, just directed by God in a lot of ways, to really just share about the kingdom in a very powerful way. Just, I think, giving us a vision of what the kingdom should be. And so um, I don't wanna spend too much time on my thoughts. I wanna definitely have Mike get a chance to share some of the uh, convictions that he came to, uh, kind of researching this and putting this together. So again, thanks again for joining us, Mike. My pleasure to be here. Thank you. Amen. Well, it's especially fun to be here with such a, an esteemed group. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Um, you know, everybody on here is awesome. And, and, and I, I will say, you know, Gordon's my hero. So um, it's, uh, it's good to be here. Amen. So uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, jump right in. Greg, take it away. <clears throat> sure. Yeah, um, first question. Um, in the first part of your book, you compare the lion to the lamb. And I really liked your analogy or, or the, the teaching I mean in there. I'd never seen that the rider on the white horse was victorious with only the blood of the lamb and the word of God. I thought that was a great insight. I read that lots and I never really caught that before. So I thank you for that, certainly. Um, and I, you know, the analogy of the lion to the lamb is a great analogy for or an example of the kingdom mindset that we should have as we approach the injustices in the world. And I was just wondering if you could share a little bit um, about the lamb and the revelation and the mindset that we should have when looking at the lamb and it's so tempting to be the lion and so tempting to be what seems so powerful. Yeah, sure. I uh, appreciate the question. Uh, you know, I think there's a, there's a, a bit of a pattern that you see in Revelation that, that happens um, quite a few times where John will hear something and turn to look and then see something else which sort of, you know, other than what he heard, uh, and it's similar, but it often brings out a different aspect or a, a deeper truth uh, of the first thing. And so in, in Revelation 5, you know, there's this scroll and the no one can open it. And I, I've sort of shorthanded it and say, you know, I mean, it's really deep what's in the scroll, but in a shorthand, it's kind of the solution to fix all the problems of mankind. And no, no one is worthy to open the scroll. And, uh, and then an elder steps forward and says, you know, there is one. There's the lion of the tribe of Judah. And as John turns, he doesn't see a, a lion. He's, what he sees is a lamb. And, and that's not to at all put down uh, the lion of the tribe of Judah. There's no question that Jesus is, is a lion. He's, he's fierce and he's powerful. But he looks like a lamb. And so really the... I think the, the back and forth comparison in the book of Revelation that John really wants us to see is, is the, the comparison between the lamb and the beast. And the beast is so much more impressive than the lamb. Um, you know, John looks at the lamb and he sees blood and he sees that it was slain and he sees, you know, th that sort of thing. But when people look at the beast, they, you know, their response is, who is like the beast? Who can make war against the beast? You know, and the beast brings economic prosperity and security and comfort. And so that, that's really, I think, a, a big part of what's going on in Revelation is we're drawn to the beast. Uh, but it's this, this lamb, this way of sacrifice, of laying down our lives that we're called to, because we see it too in, in chapter 12 it says you know the people of the messiah triumphed over the dragon by the blood of the lamb and the word of their own testimony so there again is that idea of just it's the, the word and the blood of the lamb 
is what's going to change things in the world. It's not, you know, we'll be drawn to power. And, and I think that's the thing. The beast always promises uh, security and comfort and good things here, uh, you know, on earth. And, and you see that, you know, politicians are tempted to do that. Every politician has all the solutions. And I'll give you, if you vote for me, I'll give you this and this and this and bring you all the good things. And Jesus is like, does, does he not get how to be a good politician? Because he's like, yeah, if you want to follow me, uh, you're going to have to go to your own death, carry your cross. This is going to be really hard. You will be persecuted. Uh, it's the exact opposite of what, uh, you know, most politicians do. Sure. No, I appreciate that. And that is great insight. And I want to echo Atoma's <laughs> statement that, you know, this really is a courageous book and a timely book. And I want to say, I appreciate you writing it. Um, the next question was, in your book, you share that we're meant to live as though we're in the age to come. We're not meant to be American Christians or South African Christians or anything, but rather citizens of God's kingdom. And that's such, you know, I mean, that's worth hours of discussion right there. You know, in other words, we're meant to live out the Sermon in the Mount. Can you, you know, summarize, again, there's been many books written about that. Can you summarize a little bit about how you see what that means to us as citizens of the kingdom as opposed to Americans or whatever? Yeah. Um, again, I, I appreciate that, and I, I definitely appreciate uh, the sentiments that you echoed from Atoma, uh, although I, I, I think they're uh, overstated in the sense of I'm, I'm not that courageous. Um, Jesus was the courageous one. You know, I think delivering the Sermon on the Mount in the context that he did took courage. I'm, I'm sure. sitting here in my office writing on a computer, you know, and um, and so I definitely appreciate your words, but, um, I, you know, guys like Gordon and I, and I think Gordon will tell you too, when we write books, we're just the mailman. We're just delivering what Jesus said, you know, and, in, in a, you know, maybe a more contextualized way. Sure. Um, but I, I, you know, I think it comes down to, if, if I could summarize it in, in one verse, the Sermon on the Mount, which is a, a dangerous undertaking, but in, in Matthew 6, verse 10, Jesus says, you know, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And then he says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that really describes, I think, what it means for the kingdom to come. is for God's will to be done by his people here on in the present age on earth as though we were in his presence. You know, and, and you think about that, there's... There's an element of human nature, you know, when I was a kid, I acted differently when my parents are, were around versus when they left the house. You know, I obeyed a little bit differently. Um, you know, we tend to drive a little bit differently if we're in the presence of a state trooper. Um, and so what Jesus is saying is, I, I want you to become people who recognize that you're always in the presence of God, that you, you know, and, and live that way, but live in as though we were already in that future age. And so the, what Jesus goes on to describe in chapter 5 and really throughout the Sermon on the Mount, but especially the, the last 10 verses of chapter 5, is <clears throat> this, this, you know, in the age to come, um, there won't be evil. There won't be enemies. There won't be, you know, violence and that sort of thing. And so Jesus is saying, I want you to live that way now. Uh, if somebody hits you in the face, you don't have enemies. So you have to figure out how you're going to respond to this person when you don't have enemies, when you don't have hate, you don't speak the language of hate, you don't speak the language of violence. And that's, that's risky stuff. And that's, again, that's kind of the theme of the kingdom is that empire offers safety. The kingdom is risky in, in the present age, especially because it calls us to a life that's not fair. Um, and, and so there's always this, this weird sort of irony of the kingdom of where we're living out justice for other people while at the same time not expecting it for ourselves. We're, you know, we're, we're living for the benefit of others, but sacrificing ourselves. And that's, that's really the embodiment of the Sermon on the Mount in the kingdom is how, how do we live that way? It's easy to say, but it's, it's hard, harder to do. Yeah, amen. That's so true. Thank you for that. I, I appreciate that. And it really is where the rubber meets the road is, as Christians. Absolutely. Oh, Gordon, you're on mute. 
Okay. I, I do have several questions for you, Michael. All right. Uh, Michael is uh, definitely one of my heroes. I'll get to summarize a bit today at the end about his book and the effect that it had on me. But uh, he's written several books that have had tremendous effect on me. Uh, this book on uh, Escaping the Beast, I love the political theme of that. Uh, going back to Revelation, because that book is very, very important in contrasting God's kingdom with the uh, Roman Empire. But um, when we uh, look at how we respond to political entities or to the kingdom of God, you use the word allegiance a lot, which is a wonderful concept. And so the question arises, if our allegiance gets out of uh, balance or gets uh, off focus, and we focus too much on politics, then that's going to affect uh, what you have called prophetic voice that the church or God's kingdom is to have. And so I'd love to hear you discuss some about what happens when the allegiance gets all focused onto politics, how that affects our allegiance to the kingdom. And then also you commented that uh, our prophetic voice uh, to the world, our example to the world has to begin with us in the kingdom of God and how we take care of each other, uh, how we seek justice uh, for one another in the kingdom. Um, and so tie all of that together, if you could, the prophetic voice, how it begins, what it means, and the whole concept of allegiance. Sure. Yeah, you know, uh... A few years back, and, and my memory's going to fail me here to remember who it was, but there's a, a Christian rapper who, who uh, did a song, and it was called I Signed Up to Die. And, you know, I, I think it's important to, to remember that, that, um, you know, we, get, we give up our life in order to exchange it for Jesus. And, and that means complete and total allegiance to him. He's, he becomes our king and he dictates you know the purpose of our life and what we're doing and what we're trying to accomplish and if we don't give him total allegiance then we will be become representing other things we'll be an ambassador for other things and just on a practical level i've seen a lot of christians that you know are well meaning and i love them but i can go to their social media page and immediately tell you where they're political allegiances lie and where their national allegiances lie but just looking at their social media i would have a hard time determining where their spiritual allegiances lie and and the reality is those are not even on the same plane and so in the you know in the early church when they declared that jesus is lord there was a implicit uh statement there being made that caesar was not that rome was not their primary allegiance that they were divesting of their political and national allegiances in order to follow the kingdom, that the, that the agendas of the two were so different that you couldn't be holding to, to both of them uh, at the same time. And, and I've said often, I think, and I'm not advocating that we change uh, our wording, but just to understand, I think if, if we were to make a, a baptismal statement like Jesus is Lord, that was as subversive and challenging politically for us as Jesus as Lord was for the early Christians, it would be, I pledge allegiance to Jesus and, you know, to, to challenge that. But I think, I, I think in being the prophetic community, and I, and I borrow that phrase from Brueggemann and it, it's, it's, uh, he's a biblical scholar and it's not related to prophecy in the sense of foretelling the future, but uh, prophetic in the sense of speaking God's word to the culture and, and being a society that, again, and here, here's that idea that Greg asked about of the, the age to come, where we're rooted in the future. And, and the way I see it is conservatives, and, and I'm broadly generalizing here, tend to be rooted in the past. And so they idealize the past. Let's go back to the past. That's when we were great. That's how we'll become great again. Let's keep the values of the past. And so they, they really create a, a false idealized version of the past mm -hmm. uh, in order to inform the present. Liberals tend to be all about the present because we've, we've got to change things now. We've got to fix now. 
and we keep progressing, and there's that idea of progressivism, we keep progressing, we'll reach utopia. And so liberals, if we focus on the present, will reach utopia. Conservatives are, if we keep focused on the past, will reach utopia. And the prophetic community is actually rooted in the future and says, we, we've got to look at what, where God is taking the world, who God wants us to be down the road, and then start living that way now. And, and I think that helps keep us informed where we don't, we don't ignore the past. We don't become numb to the present, but we, we interpret the past based on the future. And we act in the present based on, uh, you know, representing the kingdom of God. And, and the last thing I'll say on that is this, you know, I, I can't speak for every church or every situation, but I know what I've experienced in, you know, my fellowship, our fellowship of churches was, um, you know, when I studied the Bible to become a Christian, um, you know, I was studied through and, and brothers sat down with me and talked about my, my personal sins. And we looked at passages like Galatians 5 and talked about the things that I needed to change and repent of and turn over to Jesus. And that was all good. But what I don't see um, very often is a focus on some of the more corporate, cultural, societal sins. And, uh, you know, I know, Gordon, you and I have talked about this, and I think we uh, agree on this pretty firmly. But, you know, and, and we're actually, you know, working on some things here um, of how to address that in, in our Bible studies, of how to address, you know, our, our nationalistic allegiances, political allegiances, racial allegiances, and prejudices and materialistic allegiances culturally and some of those things that are really causing division because what happens is if we don't examine those we kind of smuggle them in with us to the kingdom and, and then they become divisive because we have these different side of the aisle sort of allegiances and we haven't dropped them and you know I, I think the reason the New Testament highlights the fact that two of Jesus core followers were a zealot and a tax collector is not to say, hey, you know what, these two guys just didn't talk about politics. Because I can imagine it, if that was their scenario, they wouldn't have gotten any farther past, you know, when Jesus was asked in the temple, should we take, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? The zealot and the tax collector are going to have a fist fight over that question. But it's, it's brought up in the New Testament because they've dropped those allegiances. And it's showing, look, guys from either side of the aisle have dropped these allegiances to follow Jesus, to make him king. And that's how we're going to, you know, that's what we need to do in the kingdom. Uh, we have these arguments and start to look just like the world because, quite frankly, I don't think Jesus is our sole allegiance. Well, that's... Uh... That's a lot in a short time there, Michael, but uh, you've tempted me now to rewrite the uh, confession. I pledge allegiance to Christ, <laughs> his kingdom. Uh, so I'll probably get in trouble with that one. The next question ties right in, though, with uh, what you said there about the allegiance part. Uh, can you say a few words about how our family of churches might consider a theopolitical stance uh, regarding how we respond to various political matters that come up, practical considerations, guidelines, whatever that could help us, but uh, explain what you mean by theopolitical and uh, how we could use that to address the subject of politics in a very spiritual way. Yeah, no, I appreciate the question. And, and you know, a lot of, I've been asked a lot lately, like, well, how should we engage in politics. I'm like, well, that, that's why I wrote a book. It, it took me a whole book to answer that one question. Um, you know, I guess I got to work on, on being more concise. Um, but uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I think the term theopolitical for me simply is refocusing our, our political eyes uh, with God first and saying, you know, that's that's what has to come first again is is the kingdom, but, you know, you kind of have equal and opposite ends. You have, uh, you know, a Christian tradition of pietism where we just say, you know, let's withdraw from the world and just focus on spiritual things and making disciples and that kind of thing. And, 
and I understand that temptation. Believe me, I've uh, there's been times when I've driven by an Amish settlement and been like, you know, they might be onto something there. Let's just all move to the same place and not have to deal with all this stuff. Um, but I, I don't think that that, uh, you know, that model will help us be the salt and light of the world the way, you know, Jesus called us to be. I think f for me, the one commonality of salt, light, and a city on the hill is you know when they're there. You know, there's no mistaking it. And, and on the other end is, you know, full bore, let's go social justice, let's follow the solutions of the world. Um, I'm not advocating for any of, of that either. Uh, I think, you know, some of those movements can point out some of the problems that we see in the world, but they don't have the solutions if they're not following God's word and God's kingdom. And so um, I, I find that approach uh, lacking as well. And so but I think we can be engaged. God is, you know, passionate about justice. Uh, people who are like, oh, the church shouldn't be involved in justice. I, I'm kind of like, have you read the Bible? Like, have, have you looked at it lately? You know, what does Micah 6 eight? you know, act, act justly, you know, walk humbly, love mercy. Um, that That's a key of, of what God wants us to be. And so, you know, I, I take several chapters to lay out the guidelines, but I think um, or some suggestions, principles we can have in kind of guiding us in how we can engage, because I think we should engage with the world. Um, and, and the, you know, the first thing is to focus our allegiance on Jesus. If, if that's not set, we're going to get off very quickly, and we'll start following our passions. And I believe in Romans 8, it says, you know, if our eyes are not set on the things, or, or our hearts are not set on the things of the Spirit, we're not going to be able to please God. We're going to go after our own desires. Um, I think the second guideline is really important is understanding the nature of the kingdom and that the kingdom has to be chosen. The minute the kingdom is impressed on somebody, it stops being the kingdom, in my opinion. And so you're not going to bring the kingdom about by strong arming or forcing people or, you know, a lot of times we have this tendency, let's pass laws to make people be uh, morally better, but that brings them no closer to the kingdom, truly. Um, there might be a benefit to passing laws. I'm not saying, uh, you know, I'm not advocating for anarchy, but I'm just saying we've got to clearly distinguish here what we are doing. Um, I, I think we stand for justice. That's the third principle I advocate in the book. And I explain all of these in the book. I think the fourth one is to, you know, really keep our eyes focused on mercy over judgment. And, you know, it's really easy to veer the other way. Uh, I think the fifth thing is to stand in solidarity and empathy with especially the oppressed. And, you know, Jesus, I don't think it's a mistake that in his first public sermon, he says, this is good news for the poor and the marginalized and the prisoner and the blind and, you know, all of those things. And I'm not so sure that our gospel that we share it the way we share it uh, in American Christianity is always good news for the oppressed. I, I think we lose sight of that uh, quite often. Um, I think the seventh thing is we got to stay angry at the right things. And, and I explain what I mean by that. Um, and then we've got to use kingdom weapons. I think that's really vital. You know, I lean... Probably, I, I haven't counted up, but probably the most quoted verse in Escaping the Beast is, or passage is 2 Corinthians 10, 2 to 5, you know, where Paul talks about not using the weapons of the world and not uh, going that route. And it's interesting because I've, I've, I get accused every now and then of advocating for, you know, things like social justice. And I'm like, not, uh, not remotely. You either haven't read what I've written or you're uh, committed to, you know, misinterpreting what I say because I'm about God's justice and not social justice. Um, we have to be sacrificial. Uh, that's the next principle. I think it's really important to consider what that looks like. And then the, the, the final point that I bring out, the final guideline is where is our action going to take place? And, you know, in other words, I think a lot of what the New Testament calls us to is to become an alternate society. And we can get really distracted by wanting to fix everything in the world. And 
it kind of reminds me, you know, Jesus response when he says, look, you'll always have the poor. You're not going to be able to uh, fix everything in the world, but, but we've got to create an alternate society that sometimes, and I, and I lay out, I think when that might be, we do have to step out and, and stand up for those who can't speak for themselves. Um, but I think that's a, a, a big part of, um, you know, the, the kingdom is creating a true alternative uh, so that we can look to the world and say, hey, here's what it looks like when Jesus is king. Okay, Michael, very helpful. When I uh, started reading your book, I wondered how many specifics you would get into about what should we do in this case or that case or the other case. And uh, I was surprised with all of the very specific practicals that you gave. And so now I'm motivated to go back and read the book again. And I think uh, probably during this uh, election period, we all should read it uh, more than once. The uh, third question that I have uh, ties into your being a history teacher in an interesting way, because uh, one thing that makes your writing as good as it is, is that you have such a sense of history and the things that have occurred and are therefore likely to occur in a given setting. But the question is this, if we decide to engage in justice in society, you cite William Wilberforce. Can you share about the unique way that he fought uh, the injustice of slavery uh, in Britain? Yeah, you know, Wilberforce is a really interesting guy. And if I'm going to be honest, I, I, I hesitated using Wilberforce as an example, because on one hand, I really like his example. On the other hand, um, I was concerned with the direction that it would lead, because I find Wilberforce to be the exception rather than the norm. And so what, what I, you know, what I describe in one of the chapters there is, you know, I, I use the Amish as an example. I use some of the, you know, movements that have gone full into politics and, you know, let's, let's use the politics of the world to gain influence and change things. And Wilberforce in England in the 19th century is, is really different because he's deeply committed to, he, he and the group that he was part of, to um, changing the world through kingdom methods. And, and so he, he was deeply committed to that. And he would pray long, like sometimes years before getting involved with an issue and seek, how are we going to do this with kingdom wisdom and not just run in uh, and let the passions of the day rule or what have you, but how are we going to bring this about through strictly kingdom methods? And so he, he stepped into the world of politics. And that's the part where I say, I, I think that's the exception rather than the norm. But he went into politics for the purpose of ending slavery. That was his main goal. It was his life's work. And he, he eventually ended the slave trade. He was a deeply spiritual man who was, who was led uh, in prayer and and somehow avoided the game the the temptation of political power and you know because I think a lot of people go into politics with good intentions and they get corrupted very quickly and and Wilberforce was able to I think resist that and and again with such radical kingdom methods that sometimes people look and it's even controversial uh, because for example he, uh, you, you know, as he's trying to end slavery and, and free slaves, he advocated for paying slave owners, uh, remunerating them for their slaves. And some of us would look and say, that's horrible. And Wilberforce's point was, we're not going to show the kingdom by, you know, sort of imposing our will on somebody else and taking away what they feel is their property, even if we feel that that's monstrous and it shouldn't be their property, we're going to show compassion and empathy and love and, and justice here. And, and, and so, you know, he advocated for things like that, um, always doing it in a very specific way. And so I think that's a, an important picture uh, for us. And yet, 
uh, not to the point where I would say, let's all rush out and run for office. Uh, I think there's a lot of questions to ask and a lot of uh, steps to try before uh, we, we get to that. And, and I think there is a time and place, and I talk about that in, in the book, some of those specifics. But um, yeah, Wilberforce is a, you know, uh, a very influential guy to the point that I think you see the difference in between England and the United States. England doesn't have a war to end slavery. Um, the, the United States did. And I think one of the big differences was uh, a guy like Wilberforce. Thank you, Mike. That's, uh, that's really informative, interesting, and at the same time, the warning of how he did it uh, compared to how we're t uh, we tend to do it is an important difference to know. Thank you. Yes, I appreciate uh, everything that you've shared so far has been very helpful and informative. And my question is, um, the primary lesson from the book is that we should very rarely engage in matters outside of the church. But when and if we do engage, you provide some principles that we can follow. One of them is self-sacrifice. Yep. Can you please share about that and how that might look um, along with any other principles that we should consider? Gosh, I, I appreciate that question. Now, you're tempting me, though, because we, you know, we're, we're trying to keep to a time limit here. And each one of these, I, I, I want to go off on. And, but, you know, I, I think the passage to me, I mean, there's so many passages in the Bible about self-sacrifice. But I think one that stands out to me uh, in this kind of context is, is actually in 1 Corinthians 12 21 to 26 now i think there's no mistake that that passage takes place right before paul says now let me show you the most excellent way and starts the, the beautiful poem from first corinthians 13 about love um which is you know love is all about self-sacrifice but in first corinthians i'll kind of jump into the middle of the context he's really addressing a church that is divided in many different ways but I think the commonality of the ways that they were bringing division into the church was they were mirroring the world. They were not examining what they were doing. They were not considering the kingdom and the body. And they were looking just like the world in many ways. And in chapter 11, it's basically what Paul is saying about communion. He's, he's describing a community where you have, you know, rich disciples who have leisure time, lots of food, big houses. They're meeting together for communion meals. And you get the impression what's probably happening is those who are enslaved Christians, those who are hardworking, poor, you know, lower class Christians, well, they can't do that. They, they're coming later in the day after work or when they're available. They don't have a lot of food or supplies to bring. They were probably kept in a different room from the socially um, honorable people. You know, they're kind of they're, they're called the weak or the dishonored. Um, they're not getting food. And Paul lays into him. He's like, you are mirroring the divisions of the world, the social status, the economic uh, levels. You look just like the world. And he actually goes and says, when you take the Lord's Supper, it's not even the Lord's Supper anymore, because it's kind of a worldly supper, because you're looking just like them. And I think he continues that theme in chapter 12, when he starts talking about the gifts, because now they're creating a hierarchy based on what gift you have. And again, they're mirroring these social statuses of the world. And then he starts talking about, here's, you know, what we're going to be. We were all baptized into one body, one spirit. And in, and he goes on and describes the body. And then in verse 21 to 26, he really lays out and he says, look, out in the world, there, there are people. And by the way, don't say you don't need these people. Don't say they're not important, um, but they're not honorable. They don't have high status. They don't have a lot of things and you need them. And just like a body has parts that, you know, maybe are considered less honorable or unpresentable. You, you treat them very in a special way. He says, that's the way we need to be with the body of Christ. So if, if somebody is of a lower status or lower economic, or they're oppressed or they're marginalized or they're, you know, down several levels of justice, 
then we need to be aware of that. We need to notice that. We need to um, take steps. And he says, you know, you treat them with special honor. And then he says the parts that have honor need no special treatment. Mm -hmm. And so this isn't showing favoritism in the body of Christ. This is being the body of Christ. It's, it's paying uh, attention, learning these divisions, um, and then taking special care to make sure that they don't come into the church, that we don't just mirror them. Um, you see that right away. One of the first things the church does in Acts is they immediately, you know, they they took up and laid what they had at the apostles' feet, and they they started to bring about sort of economic equity. Paul calls for that in Second Corinthians eight. You know, he says it's not so that what we don't want is one to have a lot and one to have nothing. We want everybody to have a, a sufficient amount, and whatever it may be, because here's what happens otherwise is let's say we plant a church and it's in a very segregated community where you have white people who tend to be much higher on the economic scale living in one community. And then you have, you know, black indigenous people of color living in another community, much lower on the economic scale because of in large part, some of the sy systemic things that have gone on in history and the inequities and, um, you know, lack of access to things. And now we plant a church and we bring that in and we don't address those things. Now, they might be very kind, loving, generous yeah. people. But if we don't specifically address that, their kids are going to go to different schools. They're going to live in different neighborhoods, different realities. Like, and so w w when we then go to the world and say, hey, we got to fight for justice. And I look at the church and it looks just like the world. It mirrors the world. What do you got to teach me? What, what do you got to tell me uh, about justice? And so I think that's what Paul is saying is we got we to gotta dress in-house first and deal with these inequities first um, and drop our defensiveness to these things and see these as, as sin. It's, you know, it's not a skin problem. It's a sin problem. And we've got to look at the injustices and inequities created by sin and say, how are we really going to be the alternate community um, you know, I, I, I think that's the challenge before us. Definitely a lot to consider. And I uh, really appreciate your insight on that. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. So it's such powerful teaching that, uh, I mean, it's just transformative. And, um, I wanted to ask you, I know that, uh, the two cities church has been going through escaping the beast. And so I just wanted to ask you, you know, how have you structured the classes, you know, and also what has been the response so far? Yeah, um, so we, we are going through it. Actually, there's a number of churches that are going through it, and, and each one is uh, doing it a little differently. Um, uh, you know, they're, they're all reading the book, but as far as how they do classes along with it, uh, there are some churches that are doing uh, uh, one lesson a month for four months. There are some that are doing it in small groups. There's seven parts, you know, and, and some working with different churches. And then there's, there's a number that are doing it that I'm not involved with. But in the, in the two cities church, we, uh, we are doing the, the book over the course of 10 weeks. And so what we have is kind of a three, three part um, approach to it. Um, the first is reading the book, and we've created over those 10 weeks a, a reading schedule um, for everybody. Just, get, you know, human nature, you give a book and and 5% of your church is going to read it in a week, and the other part is going to, you know, there's going to be a big section that reads the first two chapters and then really means to finish it, but just it's just not their thing or their discipline um, or their normal habit, and so We've tried to break it down. There's only one day in the whole 10 weeks where you read more than 10 pages in a day. Um, most of the days are four to five pages. And I think that's reasonable for most people. And most people, you know, if you see it before you and it's something you got to check off every day, you, you do it. And so we just did it to be a help. But also it helps keep people on track with um, the other two elements, which are our, our discussions and our lessons. And so for 10 weeks, we have lessons and we're, 
We're, we're giving them to our family groups. Um, and they can do it one of two ways, depending, it's up to each family group leader. They can either um, distribute it to their family group and let the people watch it on their own time, or they can get online and watch the recorded lesson together at an appointed time, whenever it works for them. And so each lesson that's recorded, um, I, I'm giving, and you know, it's based on a couple of chapters of the book at a time. Um, and each lesson is about 35 minutes. And then we have one of our shepherding leaders give a response to the, to the lesson and some of their thoughts. And then um, they introduce the three discussion questions for the week. And that's the third um, prong of our approach, which is the discussion questions. Because, you know, I think learning is good. I think lessons are good. I think books are good. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't write books. But I do think there's a degree to which, you know, in a topic like this, when it, when it involves your whole community, you know, whether it's something like race or culture or politics, uh, books, lessons, workshops are really good, but they're, the analogy I've used is they're like driving to Disney World. It's great to drive to Disney World, but that's, you, you don't go to Disney World for the drive. You don't drive there and be like, all right, good drive, let's go back. You drive there to get out and go into the Magic Kingdom and enjoy all that it has there. And so I, I think a thing like this, the, the magical part of this is the discussions. It's the conversations. It's the tears we shed together. It's the hearts opening up to one another. It's the decisions that we make. It's the challenging of one another, encouraging and loving one another um, that can be facilitated, you know, and much like a drive, you might need the book, you might need the drive to get you there, but that's not the magic. And so we have each week, we have three very targeted discussion questions based on the reading, based on the lecture uh, or the lesson that helps us um, sort of facilitate those discussions so that we're not just taking in information, but actually can be um, changed by this and and grow and i you know it 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 seems like the response has been um really good i you know you never know when you're writing a book of this nature and you step in you know i remember when i was writing it and i would joke with people and say you know i've written on politics and or i'm sorry i've written on culture and race and i didn't feel like those were controversial enough so i'm going after politics now and um i may have no friends left um, when this comes out, I don't know, but um, it, the response seems to be good. And, I, you know, this week someone contacted me, and, and I think the, the best response, um, they gave me the best response I could have, which is they said, you know, they're talking about reading the book, and it says, you know, what's really changing my heart is the scriptures that you have in the book. That's why I'm really taking the time to read them wrestle with them, let you sort of frame them, you know, and set it up, but then I'm going and it's the scriptures that are changing my heart. And uh, I, I think that's, that's exactly right. And so the, that sort of response encourages me. Wow. Yeah, that's wonderful. I mean, like you said, that's, that's the ideal. Um, and I love the, uh, the amount of detail and thought that has gone into, you know, putting this together. And so I know that God is working on hearts um, and this book is a, a great part of that. So thank you. Um, and then the last question I have really is just more of a general uh, question for you. Um, as someone who kind of grew up, you know, as part of the dominant culture, um, how, well, has your perspective, first of all, has your perspective shifted over the past few years, let's say from, you know, crossing the line to this book, um, you know, has your perspective shifted? And if so, in what way or in what ways has, has it changed or, or shifted? Yeah. Um, you know, if I, you know, Gordon could probably confirm this as, as a brother who's written a lot of books as well. Um, or maybe it's just me. I don't know. But whenever I finish a book, um, you know, there's always this period like right after it hits, the publisher and gets printed there's you know you get hit with these other ideas and it's like oh i should have included that uh man i, I would have you know if i wrote it now and it's only a month later you know i would have added this and 
and there's a point where you just got to close a computer and send it in, you know, because otherwise you'd be tinkering with it forever. Um, so, I, you know, and, and I'm always trying to learn and grow and I, I don't have all the answers. I don't even remotely and I don't have it all figured out, but I've always tried to teach my students when we do classes on teaching the Bible or whatever. And, you know, I, I use this illustration between a, a flowing stream and a stagnant pond and say, you know, the, one of the main differences um, in, you know, a stream is beautiful. You go to it and the water's flowing through, but a pond, man, it stinks because there's no water coming in and no water going out. And I think that has to be, you know, how we are is, is if you're constantly learning new things and having things come in and, you know, having the spirit lead you, then you're going to be able to teach new things and have new things flow out and, and not just get stagnant. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think some of the specific things, though, are, you know, when, when I wrote Crossing the Line, which I wrote it in 2016, I think, and it came out in 2017, um, I, I didn't at that time, um, when I wrote that book, I was like, okay, that, that'll be it. Um, I, I didn't um, really have in mind, I'd be lying if I said, oh, I, I knew what a, what a factor politics played in like topics like race and, and culture. Um, but it was, it was actually the process of you know, doing workshop after workshop. And we've, we've done over a hundred now, um, sometimes just myself and then my wife, when she can join um, in, in churches, uh, over a hundred crossing the line workshops. And, um, you know, usually if we do a question and answer or a question response period, um, we, don't, we don't get beyond question two or three without a political question being asked. And, and so I started to see that while politics has to be addressed. Um, and, and I think there's as much of a tendency to not be rooted in our kingdom thinking in that as, as much as race. Um, you know, I think there's some elements of uh, culture that I've really sharpened in on lately as I've seen the, the response of this summer to the pandemic and to the racial unrest and some of that, and really seen um, you know, I've talked before about the differences between individual and collective culture, but I, I think I've really learned this summer just how much of an impact those are um, in our worldviews. And, you know, it just leads us in very different uh, directions with very different instincts. And uh, I think probably the, the other thing that I've, I've, I've grown in um, and, and it, I've learned more about and thought more about, read more about, and, and I'm probably even more willing to talk about is um, the, the real problem, I think, w which underlies a lot of uh, misunderstanding about racial issues. And I think a lot of times it's easy to think that the problem is separation of the races and that if that's what I think the problem is, then the solution is simply coming together. It's diversity. And so if I think the problem is separation and the solution is diversity, then I look at our churches that are diverse and, and I'm tempted to say mission accomplished. Um, we're, we're good to go. Job well done. And I don't want to hear anybody really bring up much about it because that might challenge or threaten our, our unity. That might be divisive. But I don't think that is the problem. The, the ongoing problem is the sin of white superiority. And that's not at all to, to make anybody feel shameful or guilty or call anybody out. Because I'm, I'm not white. Greg is not white. Gordon's not white. We just live in a society that has created this category um, you know, out of, out of greed and out of power and, right. and told certain people that they were that. And so if you look into the Bible, it, it you know, it, it, when it says like people groups, like in Revelation 5, you know, every tribe, language, people, and nation, the word behind people there is ta ethnos. It's where we get our word ethnic from. And ethnicity involves, you know, the, the region that we come from, our physical characteristics, our culture, our language, all of those things. 
God made those differences. He encourages that. We should celebrate those. But the idea that we can be grouped into five or seven little different races based on biological differences in the color of our skin, that has always been a category uh, of superiority. And, and, and it just always has. There's never been a time since race was constructed where white wasn't at the top. And so uh, race is a lie. And well, who's the father of lies? Uh, Satan. Right. And, and so I, I think we have to not, again, I, I don't feel that's a personal attack on me. That's an attack on, on Satan's lies, is to say, I've got to look at, at that and the structures that were built on that lie. And that should, the people of God should be leading the way on that. We should say, man, we got we to gotta go after that. And so, uh, you know, I could go a lot longer on that, but... Um, uh, I, you know, for, for sake of time here, I'll, uh, I'll wrap it up. But I, I, I think that's the thing. Um, and, and it's not losing sight of the gospel. It's implementing the gospel to gather the nations and say, this is a huge obstacle. This is something that we simply um, have to embrace as God's people is to do away with sin. And, you know, it impacts so much. Even I, I will give one example. I'm sorry I said I was wrapping up, but I got to say this one thing is, um, you know, I think um, uh, even the very pervasive doctrine or, or uh, you know, way of thinking about Christianity, that it's, that, that Jesus is my personal savior, you know, that whole kind of way of thinking and, and Christianity is a, is a personal, private matter, that kind of thing. That theology is rooted in white superiority. It comes straight from the slave holding South. It's, it, it, was, it was invented to separate the long historic Christian uh, passion about justice, about bringing God's justice to the world, having it be in the kingdom and then displaying it to the world. Well, you can't own other people and fully embrace that version of Christianity. So you construct a white superiority version of Christianity that says Jesus is a personal savior. This is a private religious choice. You worship God your way. I'll worship God my way and don't get involved and actually creates this mindset that to care about justice in the world is somehow to lose sight of the gospel is to, that comes straight from the slave holding South. There's just no two ways to cut that. That's, that's objective fact. And so even when the Confederacy fell, um, they won the day in, in the mind category and the theology because that's really been the pervasive version of Christianity uh, that has been embraced since. And it makes it very convenient because then we don't have to do the challenging work of the kingdom of tearing down some of these sinful structures based on lies and challenge and even look at how, wow, man, I, I have benefited from some of those things. And I've, I've got to be willing to, to lay that down. Um, you know, and so it's so much bigger than that. There's so much more than that. But that's, um, those are some of the things I continue to learn. Yeah, no, that's excellent. Thank you so much. I think it's so true. It's, you know, it's really, it's not a personal attack. It's really recognizing uh, Satan's lies and the, um, it's to his credit. Uh, that he has taken something so uh, so much the antithesis of, of what God intended the world to be, intended uh, his creation to be, and has turned it uh, to something so so evil. So thank you so much. I appreciate that answer. Thank you. You want to say a few words, Mr. Gordon? I think you're on mute also. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know if you were going to say something before me, so I'll be happy to jump in. Um, Michael and I met. I forgot the details of how we did that, but several years back, and I think it might have coincided with me starting a blog on racial issues, but uh, he became my uh, mentor and very quickly a, a good friend. And so when he was writing Crossing the Line and then uh, – the uh, second book, uh, uh, All Things to All People. Uh, and then this one, I got to read all three of those as he was writing it. 
electronically. I got to see it as he was writing it. And the impact of all three books uh, was something like this. Whoa, what just happened here? And, uh, that, that occurs when you go into reading a book and you have high expectations, but then they are so far exceeded that you're just thinking, wow, what happened here? And Michael's books affect me that way. The uh, one on politics certainly did. I think uh, a lot of it is that instinctively, uh, I've been in the ministry now for uh, 50 years. And so instinctively, I could tell that if I get involved in politics as a minister, then I'm going to take away from my message. I'm going to affect relationships with people. They'll view me differently if I come out on either side of the aisle politically. And so I began to be pretty much apolitical a long time ago because I didn't want to hurt my witness uh, for Christ, basically. And so I think in, in reading Michael's book, he's put the meat on the bones of all of this. He, he's basically explained what my sense of things was, but he's given me a lot of biblical direction, a lot of practical considerations to just help me understand um, how not to hurt my witness and yet not to compromise the gospel either in areas that both politics and the kingdom actually intersect on in some ways, things that should be dealt with, things that should be taught and believed and practiced, uh, but to do it from a kingdom perspective and not from a political perspective. So Mike does a mas masterful job of distinguishing between the two uh, allegiances, basically. And so the concept of allegiance uh, helps me uh, uh, really differentiate, I think, between the, those two. But uh, as I've said about all of Michael's books, to all of my friends, I would pay you to read it. And so uh, this book, I have bought these books. I've given them to people. I said, I'll give it to you if you'll promise to read it. Because honestly, there are people whose allegiances are so, uh, I think, off-centered that they need a lot of help. And Michael's book uh, comes at it in a way that if we'll take the time to read it and digest it, I think it will change our minds. And more importantly, I think it will change our hearts uh, toward God and his kingdom and uh, make us a lot more effective disciples uh, of his. Yeah, and I do want to just re-echo, uh, reiterate, uh, if you haven't read this book, I really want to encourage you to read it. And I think especially before the election, I think it's going to be a very contentious political season. And I think especially for disciples to not be partisan, but I think as Mike said, to be theopolitical, to really have God's view on politics. Um, I did have a quick question, Mike, as we uh, wrap it up. Um, what, I know like you have your all things to all people podcast and you, you have been going through, uh, you know, different chapters of your book, you know, all things, all people. Are you going to be going through some chapters, different excerpts of this on that? Or what's, was your thoughts? Well, now you've asked a question that I don't have an answer to. Um, <laughs> putting it out there to the whole ether the internet. No, you, you know, <laughs> um, the, the, the whole point of that podcast is uh is really to go through uh my books and and conversate on them and all that the decision that i haven't made yet and, and i've been wrestling back and forth because i think we we finish up all things to all people first first week of november is when we'll finish it and so then my question has been well you know to to do we next go into escaping the beast or um crossing the line and, you know, I, I can, depending on the day, I can swing myself one way or the other. So I think what I'm actually going to do is, is, you know, I have a pretty healthy Facebook group um, uh, that's, you know, based on the podcast, the All Things to All People podcast. And, I, and I'm going to put a poll on there and let the, the listeners decide uh, which, which book we go um, through first. And I wish I could say it's because, you know, I, I, I had the thought of, you know, just including other people and all that, but it's really because I can't make up my mind. 
Well, I'll, I'll, I'll put uh, one. I may just join that group just to put a couple votes <laughs> in uh, just for Escaping the Beast, just because I think there are going to be so many people on either side of the aisle, win or lose, as far as the election, to just really have a spiritual mindset to come back together and really be that alternate kingdom and not be American disciples or, you know, Republicans or Democrats, you know, so yeah. that's just my I, I appreciate that. And I, I could be proven really wrong here, but I, I would be surprised if we even know who's won the election by the first week of November. So uh, <laughs> I think we have to be ready for that. It's, it's going to be a bumpy ride. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and I, and quite frankly, I'll just say this politics wise for our country, I don't think the bumpy ride ends in November of this year either. I think it's, uh, um, I think we're actually just getting, we, we've been standing in line. We're just getting on the roller coaster now. Um, I think we've got a long way to go. And as the people of God, if we are not really centered on what it means to be the kingdom, um, we're going to be in trouble as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, last, last question. How many, do you know how many churches that you're aware of are actually going through the book right now? Oh, I don't know. Um, you know, uh, one of the, one of the challenges for me, and I, I've kind of joked a little bit that this is not the summer for relaxation. If you've written a book on race, culture, and politics. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful for the, in the sense that there are a number of churches going through each one of those four books. Um, I, I know, um, you know, some churches I know, the ones that directly contact me, but then, you know, sometimes I'll hear from a member or something and be like, oh, our church is going through that book. And I, I had no idea, um, which is fine. I'm, I'm not encouraging every church that's going through it to contact me necessarily. <laughs> I'm not, because uh, I'm not encouraging that. Not discouraging it, but you know what I mean. There's a there's a limit there, but no, I I, I have no idea. Uh, yeah, I just I'm. Uh, if it helps people, amen. And I, I don't really keep up with things like that. Um, I, you know, yeah, I, I'm just not. Can't answer that one. Well, again, thanks so much for writing the book. Uh, I will definitely be uh, trying to see if I can get through it again for the second time before the election. It has been very helpful. Uh, for those of you that enjoyed the episode, please click like and consider subscribing for more awesome episodes in the future. Thank you.